Okay, in this clip, we're still solving polynomial inequalities. In example two, they just want you to focus a little bit more on another strategy that you can apply. There's well, some things that kind of help tie these things together, and that is to solve a polynomial inequality using end behavior. Now, I preluded this a little bit in the first clip, but here's what we're doing. First of all, I recognize that this first inequality is nothing more than a quadratic inequality, so we need to get one side equal to zero. So 2x squared, I'm going to move the 2x over there, so minus 12x. I move the 16 over here, so plus 16 has to be less than or equal to zero. I recognize that a factor of 2 is in all three uh, monomials, so I'm going to pull out a 2. I'm going to have x squared minus 6x plus 8 is less than or equal to zero. Factor out that monomial makes it quite a bit easier to factor our trinomial, so I'm going to factor into two binomials, less than or equal to zero. x squared is x and x. Factors of 8, that would give me a 6. How about minus 2 and minus Four. So now I know the location of the zeros. The zeros of this equation are at x equals a 2 and a 4. So we're going to graph those on our x-axis or our number line. So at a positive 2 and a positive 4, our graph must cross the um, x-axis. Um, just to speak on this too, this is a constant. It doesn't do anything except stretch the graph. It doesn't change your, your zeros of the function, so that will not have an impact on the zeros of the function at all. The original function that we had was positive, so it was smiling. So we're smiling here. And we can go right to interpreting from our graph. But let's include what they want us to focus on, the end behavior. Now it's a second degree polynomial, so we know the end behavior is the same because the leading coefficient is positive. The end behavior has to be going towards positive infinity. So this end behavior is going to positive infinity, and this end behavior is positive infinity. They always kind of like us to think of it in terms of limit. So as a limit of x approaches a negative infinity, then what will our function f of x do? Well, our function is going to approach a positive infinity. So if we use this concept of the end behavior, what we can say is the 2 divides this into three intervals along with the 4. So there's an interval number 1, interval number 2, and an interval number 3. In the intervals 1 and 3, the number line got chunked up into three different intervals. In interval 1 and 3, the end behaviors have to be going towards positive infinity just by looking at that, so we know that the middle one, or the region 2, interval 2, is where our solutions lie. Now, because this is a less than or equal to, I want to include these in the solution set and everything in between. So, simply put, the interval in which all of our solutions lie are between 2 and 4 inclusive, so using the square brackets. So, tying in this concept of end behavior and how it can help you, also with the quadratics, you can just draw a smiley face on it. And know where it's above and below. So we've got several strategies that do help us graph the inequalities, solutions to these inequalities. So let's take a look at the next example. And this is the first example we've had where it's been a non-quadratic. So this is our cubic function. Um, we don't have any great ways of factoring this cubic. There's no monomial factor that would be beneficial to us. So we're going to have to rely on our strategies that we've learned on how to find zeros of polynomial equations. We're going to use technology to help us find these, and we're also going to use our synthetic division to help us find the others. So here's what I'm asking you to do. When you have a cubic or a larger function, you may go ahead and use your calculator, put the equation into your graphing calculator, and you can get a picture of this, and hopefully this will lead you to some intelligent choices for the zeros of the function, or at least give you some good guesses on where it might be. So I'm going to look at the graph of this. This is the graph of this function, and it looks as though a negative 1, negative 2, negative 3 would be a zero of this function. Now, using this technology allows me to narrow down my search. Not only does this help me, if negative 3 is a zero, because it is tangent to this axis, it's a double root, which means the other one over here has to be the third root. So it looks like there will be three real solutions to this graph. There will be a double root at negative 3, and there looks like there's one in between 2 and 3, so maybe 2 and a half. So using this technology, we said that a negative 3 is a great candidate for a zero of the function. So now I'm going to put a negative 3 out in my division bar and use synthetic division. I've got a 2, 7, negative 12, negative 45. Now we're going to verify that negative 3 was a zero of the function. So you can either use that abridged version that I've been doing or you can use the full chart. I don't care. I'm going to use the abridged version of this. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to bring down the 2. 2 times a negative 3 is a negative 6. Negative 6 and 7 is a 1. Negative 3 times 1 is a negative 3. Negative 3 onto a negative 12 is a negative 15. Negative 3 times negative 15 is a positive 45. 
positive 45 and a negative 45 is? Zero. Now, because this was a third degree polynomial coming in and I found a remainder of zero, that means my new function has to be a second degree polynomial. And my second degree polynomial will look like this, 2x squared minus x minus 15. And I can think of it as equals zero. Now, I can either use quadratic formula or I can use factoring techniques. Or if you prefer, if you really wanted to, since we saw that that was tangent, we could come back up here and we could run synthetic division again, only on this new line, use a different color here, as a negative 3. Remember, in our graph, at a negative 3, 1, 2, 3, we saw the graph come up here, be tangent to, and then come back down. Because it was tangent, we should suspect that this negative 3 will be another 0. So I'm going to draw the line, bring down my first number, which is a 2. Negative 3 times 2 is a negative 6. Negative 6 and 1 is a negative 5. Negative 3 times negative 5 is a positive 15. Positive 15 and negative 15 is 0. Now that was a second degree polynomial, so what is left is a first degree polynomial or a linear equation. And here's our linear equation, which is going to be 2x minus 5. Now I know all the related linear factors. I could write x minus 3 down twice, or I could say x minus 3 squared. And that now equals our polynomial function in factored form, and we want it to be greater than or equal to 0. So what we've really, or realis realistically done, we've taken this cubic function, we found all of its zeros, and from its zeros I can find its related factored form. And really what we want on this is its zeros. So we have this one at a negative 3, and we have another one at 1, 2, 3, 1 at 2 and a half, because our related 0 to this factor is going to be when 2x minus 5 is equal to 0, so at 5 halves. And our other related 0 is at um, well, x plus 3. I'm sorry. This was the 0, so our related factor is x plus 3, which makes our or 0, negative 3, which is what we found through synthetic division anyway. So then it's coming back up here, crossing through. Now if we use our graph, we can, we can see very easily um, where the graph is above and below. And since we wanted it to be greater than or equal to 0, there's only the parts that we want is when it's equal to 0, which is at 3, or when it's above 0, which is or at a negative 3, or when it is greater than 5 halves. So our solutions are going to be like this that are number line. Using just a couple different strategies, talking about the end behavior strategy that they want us to look at more specifically in these examples. It was a third degree polynomial, leading coefficient was positive, so it's going to go from low up and finish high. It'll be an S shape because it's cubic. So they're saying we should be able to use the end behavior as a limit as x approaches a negative infinity. Because it starts low and finishes high, our function f at x, and this one should go to negative infinity. So from this zero, we should have an end behavior that's going towards negative infinity, which means in this interval, and this time we're going to have more, uh, an interval number one, which goes anywhere from negative infinity to negative three, interval number two, which is going to fill in the void in between our negative three and five halves, so that's interval number two, and then our last interval is going to be out here in interval number three. And our end behavior should tell us as the limit as x approaches a positive infinity, because our function was an odd um, degree and it was positive, it's going to have to approach positive infinity. So we know it's going to be positive up here, it's going to be negative down here. Now we can use this idea of it's going to change signs, it's going to be negative infinity on the left side from when x approaches negative infinity. Up here at a negative 3, it's going to be exactly 0. It touches and returns as tangent. And then it's going to be negative all the way in interval 2, and it's only going to be positive in interval 3. According to our inequality sign, we want all those where it's greater than or equal to 0, so we only want the positive ones, or equal to 0. To summarize this, the, our standings here then, it's equal to 0 at negative 3, so we simply put negative 3 as a solution, and the other part is going to be in an interval from 5 halves to positive infinity. So we can also run an interval line test in here as well. If you want to go through and, and test each of those, if you're not sure about it, you've got graphical evidence, you've got end behavior evidence. You could also come through here and say, well, I'm not quite certain what's going on. Let me try a value here at negative 4. You could run this through your factors and say, will it be positive or negative factor? So a negative 4 times 2 is going to be a negative 8 minus 5. That's a negative value. 
and then negative 4 minus 3, and we're going to square it. So negative 4 minus 3 would be negative 1, but square is going to be positive. And a positive times negative is always negative. So we're just confirming that our end behavior was right, that our graph was right. And we could do interval line tests for all of these in between in region 2 and region 3. Uh, I'm not going to run that. I'm going to say if you don't understand how to perform the interval line test and you need it to help you find where your solutions are to come contact me um, in class or outside of class. So that's the nature of what we're doing.